But we begin tonight with the architect of the plan to keep Donald Trump in power after he lost, John Eastman. The former Trump attorney and one of 19 co-defendants facing charges in the Georgia criminal case. Last week, Eastman was booked into the Fulton County Jail, still pushing the big lie immediately after surrendering to authorities over efforts to overturn the Georgia election. Eastman is the author of the coup memo, the one advancing the fringe legal theory that a U.S. vice president has unilateral authority to reject certified state electors. The proposal was used to try to persuade Mike Pence to overturn the 2020 results. The receipts of his plot are so damning. Former White House lawyer Eric Hirschman advised him to get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. Sound advice. To get an idea of where Eastman may fall on the integrity scale, he once served as clerk for Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court and is now facing disbarment proceedings in California. In true MAGA attorney fashion, none of this stopped him from going on Fox to self-troll about his legal problems. Last night... When Laura Ingraham asked whether prosecutors can prove their case against him, this was his response. So they've got all my emails. My phone was seized over a year ago, so they've got all that stuff as well. And I challenge them to find a single email or communication that supports that uh, implausible theory. Except, guess what? Those emails do exist. And they are public, man. Eastman may be right about one thing, though. They won't find a single email, but rather many Many, many, many emails pushing the theory that then-Vice President Mike Pence had the authority to subvert the Constitution. He even sent pressure cooker emails as rioters literally descended on the Capitol calling for Pence's head. But it isn't just about his emails, right? Eastman can get real chatty, as he did last night, or when he's serving as hype man for Trump's radicalized followers. We know there was fraud, traditional fraud, that occurred. We know that dead people voted. And all we are demanding of Vice President Pence is this afternoon at 1 o'clock, he let the legislatures of the state look into this so we get to the bottom of it and the American people know whether we have control of the direction of our government or not. But then there are the other times when it's just crickets. Remember his deposition to the January 6th committee after Trump declined to give him that presidential pardon? Here's a refresher. I assert my Fifth Amendment right against uh, being compelled to be a witness against myself. Did the Trump legal team ask you to prepare a memorandum regarding the vice president's role in the counting of electoral votes at the joint session of Congress on January 6th, 2021? Yeah. Dr. Eastman, did you advise the President of the United States that the Vice President could reject electors from seven states and declare that the President had been reelected? Fifth. 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 Eastman said, I plead the fifth repeatedly while deposed by the committee 100 times to be exact. Meanwhile, another one of the co-defendants, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, is perhaps taking a different tack to save his own skin by refusing to keep mum about his actions as detailed in the indictment. Meadows took to the witness stand earlier this week to bolster his bid to move the Fulton County case to federal court. He testified that he believed his actions detailed in the indictment fell within the scope of his duties as White House Chief of Staff. His hearing transcript could be released tonight or tomorrow morning. But his testimony could, get this, help the prosecutors in the case. Because, as detailed in the Daily Beast, what Meadows is saying is exactly what Fonnie Willis is trying to prove, that Trump was at the center of this entire criminal enterprise. Joining me now is Timothy Hafey, former lead investigator for the House January 6th Select Committee, Katie Benner, MSNBC contributor and national reporter for The New York Times, and Tristan Snell, former assistant attorney general for the state of New York, and the man who led the prosecution of Trump University. Thank you all for being here. Timothy Hafey, I want to start with you first. Um, let's start with, let's go backwards. Let's talk about Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows wants his case to be federalized, but it does seem that the more he talks to try to get that to happen, the more he hurts Trump. Is that how you see it? I think the Daily Beast story, Joy, is exactly right. He essentially confirmed that President Trump was in control of all of his activities and, by extension, the activities of the other charged co-conspirators. That is exactly the theory that the district attorney will present, that this was a conspiracy with a hierarchy. And at the very head of the hierarchy, 
was President Trump. Now, Meadows thinks that that helps him because it suggests that he was doing everything in his official capacity. The problem is that a lot of what he was doing has nothing to do with any federal authority, an issue controlled by the federal government. It has to do with state elections, which are clearly within the ambit of state officials, not federal, or campaign activity, which is also beyond the scope of what the chief of staff does. So I don't know that he helped himself, but he certainly helped Fonnie Willis. Let's go to Eastman for just a second. I mean, you all were not able to get him to do more than plead the fifth over and over 100 times. Um, what do you make of the fact that he's, he wouldn't talk to y'all, but he went on Fox and told a lot of stuff that doesn't seem helpful either? No, he went on Fox last night and he again said there was serious voter fraud. Again, he's a lawyer and lawyers have a duty of candor at, at all times. State bars have found they have a duty of candor when they speak out publicly. And there's just no factual foundation, Joy, for that assertion. He similarly has said repeatedly that the vice president has this unilateral authority to accept certain electors and not others. Again, no foundation. And his own emails show that he questioned the validity of that theory back in October before the election. And then even in his late hour conversations with Mike Pence and with Mark Short trying to persuade the vice president, he acknowledged that that theory would lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court. So again, no factual nor legal basis for the things that he was saying. You know, Tristan, it, you were giving him the amen, so I'm going to come to you next, because, you know, the, the reality is, Eastman doesn't seem super bright. I mean, Trump has sort of said, well, he's the most genius, you know, constitutional scholar in history, blah, 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 blah. But, there, you know, there's a sense, I mean, he has this connection to Clarence Thomas. There was some talk in the indictment, as, as laid out in the indictment, that at least at some point there, there was a belief among some of these conspirators that they could get this case to the Supreme Court. And they think that maybe, maybe they had maybe two people who go along with it. One can assume it's Clarence. Um, and he actually is one of the people who's, you know, written sort of a letter attesting to Clarence Thomas's integrity. I'm not sure he's a great character witness. He, he doesn't seem to be helping anyone um, other than the prosecutors at this point. What do you make of uh, Eastman's lugubriousness? You know, the thing is, Eastman is, you know, by, by all appearances, he's a true believer. He actually seems to believe all of this crap. And I don't think that he actually understands the, the fact that he keeps on digging a bigger and bigger hole for himself at this point. You know, uh, he wanted to he wanted to plead the fifth when he had that deposition. But every time he speaks in public, he's basically, uh, you know, he's basically inculpating himself. So he, he pleaded the fifth when it mattered. But then when the cameras are on, he goes ahead and he mouths off. So I, I don't really think that this uh, that this helps him. It doesn't help him with his disbarment proceeding in, in California either. Uh, you know, the, the, the real rub for a lot of these folks, and, and Eastman very much falls into this category, is that unlike Trump, who doesn't use email or text messages, although might have been DMing on Twitter uh, enticingly, uh, you know, Eastman was creating memos out of his felonies. He was emailing his felonies. Uh, so there's plenty, as you were putting it before, there's plenty of emails, there's plenty of receipts here. Uh, Eastman is very boxed in, and he keeps on making it worse. You know, Katie, I you know sometimes do wonder. I mean, at this point, the interests of all of these parties are starting to break apart. Um, you know, it, people are starting to think about themselves and be and behave in rational ways, which is do things to help themselves rather than just help Trump. And I wonder if Trump world has a fear of one more than the other, because it seems both of these men are unhelpful. But there are other people who could be potentially unhelpful, either uh, people who have not gotten their legal bills paid. Trump clearly doesn't seem to have the, mo the money to be able to do that since he's lied about his mm -hmm. income. We're going to get to that in a moment. But I wonder if within Trump world, there's a fear of one more than the other or maybe a, a sort of growing sense that maybe all of these cases may redound to Trump's detriment. You know, I think that at this point, it's, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to get into the heads of people in Trump world and say what they're saying, because I really don't know. But I think that for prosecutors, they are going to be very watchful of what happens in these, to your point, dynamics between the various defendants. What people will be looking for is whether or not somebody is really loyal to Trump. And in some ways, this trial in Georgia is kind of a litmus test for the power that Donald Trump has over his circle. We've seen in all of these different venues, whether it was the Mueller investigation, whether it was the January 6th committee investigation, whether it was January 6th, whether it was the documents case, there's been such fealty and loyalty to Donald Trump. But now that people are facing the prospect of prison time in a Georgia state prison, 
it's, it's something that people are going to be looking for. Will they finally crack? Is there something that can break that spell that Donald Trump has long had over pretty much all of his associates, with the exception of Michael Cohen? Even Rudy Giuliani, as we've seen today, you know, he's facing like really serious legal problems. He has no money. He cannot pay his legal bills. He still has complete fealty to Donald Trump. And again, it's we're going to find out probably in Georgia just how far that goes. Well,